A small study conducted in China in March revealed that five recovered coronavirus patients tested positive days or even weeks after testing negative. This is also happening for a growing number of patients in South Korea. As countries look to end lockdowns, these reports are raising questions among public health experts about faulty testing, whether patients are getting reinfected, and just how long a full recovery might actually take. An early clinical trial in China tested whether an HIV drug could help treat COVID-19. It was unsuccessful, but it revealed interesting findings. When the researchers sampled patients for their viral load, they found roughly 60% were still shedding virus at day 28. Viral load refers to the amount of virus a person is carrying and potentially spreading. The implications of what this means are uh, still yet to be determined. In the U.S. and other countries, the majority of patients are not tested for the virus after they recover. And the advice from the CDC is to quarantine for 14 days and until they stop experiencing symptoms. But recovery isn't an on-off switch, nor is it uniform among people. So how does our body typically defend itself against an invader? The process has several stages. It starts with the physical barriers. There is mucus in the nose that traps pathogens, as well as tiny hairs in the nose and trachea that sweep out invaders looking for cells to infect. Cells in the nose have a protein that the new coronavirus can bind to. It uses that as a kind of doorway in. Infected cells send out molecular signals that alert neighboring cells that they've been infiltrated. Among the most important are molecules known as interferons. Their job is to interfere with the virus's ability to spread. Cells called phagocytes engulf and chew up infected ones. These cells also produce molecules known as cytokines that cause swelling. The goal is to rope off and isolate infected cells and tissue to further control infection and stem the spread of the virus. That would finalize what I would say of the first initial layers of what we call this innate response that is, is relatively fast and is very resourceful. For most invaders, these early defenses are good enough and we never even notice. But some viruses like influenza and coronaviruses, including the novel one, are stealthier. So they can dodge these defenses and replicate unchecked in the body for some time. When we feel sick, we're feeling the effects of our immune system fighting the virus. With coronavirus, scientists think there is a very sharp increase in viral load during the first few days of infection. The higher the viral load, the more infectious someone is. The fact that we don't feel symptoms for days suggests the virus is very good at getting around the defenses that the body has to fight infection. That also helps it spread. In the most severe COVID-19 cases, it's the inflammation that gets out of control and causes all sorts of other complications, like heart issues and neurological problems. We have a third layer that is very, very powerful. Phagocytes that aid up infected cells carry viral proteins back to the lymph nodes. It's there that another set of fighters, known as B-cells and T-cells, will be called into action. They use those viral remnants as templates to build a more tailored attack. This takes about a week. Then those, those T-cells and B-cells are sent back to the site of infection. In this case, it could be the lung. T-cells learn to very specifically recognize and kill cells that are already infected, sparing those that aren't. B cells make antibodies that latch onto the virus and prevent it from entering new cells. If it can't enter cells, it can't replicate. At first, these antibodies aren't very good, but with time, they become better and better. For COVID-19 patients, tests can pick up antibodies starting at about 10 days after symptoms begin, according to recent research. For many viral infections, this is typically good enough to protect us from getting sick again. As this is going on, the amount of virus in the body starts to level off. How long this takes depends on a variety of factors, including age, gender, pre-existing conditions, how severe an infection was, prior immunity, and how good an individual's immune response is. Some people might only experience mild symptoms. In fact, they might not even notice them at all. We only have somewhat limited data on the viral load of these people. So it's actually not clear if these people clear infection more rapidly or more efficiently, uh, or if it's simply that they clear the virus the same way the other folks clear the virus, 
but that they managed to not have this excessive harmful immune response uh, that, that causes damage down the road. So in some people it looks like a week, some people it looks like several weeks, and then it disappears. But after that, when you look carefully at the data, what you see are these uh, data points that we call blips, where there are these small amounts of virus that become present, and then the next day they're gone, and then maybe three days later they're there again. And for how long that that process persists, I think, is unknown. More data is needed to know for sure, but Dr. Schiffer suspects these tiny viral flare-ups might be causing some of the positive tests in patients who previously tested negative. Scientists have observed this kind of behavior in the past with other infections like influenza, but what it might mean for the novel coronavirus is still unclear. Alternatively, the positive tests could be picking up dead fragments of the virus that are still in the body. Some recent data from South Korea suggests this might be going on in some patients. Different parts of the body seem to clear the virus at different rates. In a study of 33 patients, spit and mucus samples were virus-free within five weeks for most patients. In stool samples, the virus persisted beyond five weeks for many. Viruses like herpes and chickenpox can lie dormant for months or even years before becoming active again. Scientists haven't observed this phenomenon in coronaviruses yet and think it's unlikely. Their short genetic codes don't have the bandwidth to produce the proteins that would help them settle in a human cell, lay dormant and then resurface. Scientists think these blips pose little threat to individual patients because the viral levels are low and the immune system is better equipped to fight the virus off. My educated guess based on our experience with other viruses is that at the individual level, the probability of transmitting when one is shedding for brief periods of time at very low viral loads is very low. The problem is, is that it only takes one transmission event to re-spark an epidemic. That risk will diminish if scientists can develop a vaccine, or if patients can build up long-lasting immunity, which would limit the ability of the virus to spread to other people. With some viruses, like measles, immunity lasts a lifetime. With the coronaviruses that cause the common cold, it wanes after a few months, leaving us vulnerable to reinfection. We don't yet have enough data to know how long our molecular memory for the new coronavirus might last. What does that mean for policies on lockdowns, on quarantines, that sort of thing? It's a very difficult question. Throughout the world, I, I don't think there will be very many locations where herd immunity is relevant yet. And so when we get the case count down to close to zero in many cities, we're back where we started with a highly susceptible population, a virus that spreads very easily from person to person. And the spark might be a traveler coming in from a different city. So the answer is going to come down to the same things which everyone is talking about, which is very wide availability of testing and then contact tracing upon detecting early cases.